Hey everyone, I'm Golden Sound, you're watching The Headphone Show by Headphones.com, and this weekend I thought we'd do something a little bit different than usual. The world's in a little bit of a serious place at the moment, so I thought let's do something a little bit more light this weekend. Rather than do a full review or dive deep into a topic, I'm just going to tell you about a number of different DACs and amps that I think are particularly good or interesting for one reason or another, and tell you why that's the case. This is in no particular order, it's not a complete list of the absolute best sounding products that I think exist, it's just a number of different things that I particularly enjoy and I want to tell you why. If we are talking about DACs and amps specifically, then by law we kind of have to start with a classic. The family favourite, the children's favourite. And that is of course the Apple dongle, or the full name being the Apple USB-C to 3.5mm headphone adapter, or lightning if you get that variant. The Apple dongle is a product which no doubt many of you guys would have seen, perhaps even own yourselves, and a lot of people, maybe if they're newer to the hobby, will have seen recommendations for this and not quite realise that they weren't a joke. This might be a little bit of a meme, but it's cliche because it's valid enough to bear repeating again and again and again. This is a $10 product. For value for money, nothing else really gets close to this, and that's because this is $10 and it does not suck. In terms of total harmonic distortion performance, it gets about 100 dB, so it's already exceeding 16-bit range and it's already outperforming a number of other desktop products as well. And the fact that this performs pretty decently as a standalone DAC and for running headphones directly as well if you want to, and again it's only $10, means that for anyone that's looking for an upgrade from their crappy onboard motherboard audio in either their laptop or their desktop, $10 fixes that problem straight away, and that's pretty awesome. There is one major weakness to this product though, which is that whilst the American version will do one volt output, the European version will only do half a volt output. And in either region, if you run this on an Android device, it'll limit the output to about 0.1 volts, so that may mean that some headphones you just won't be able to turn them up enough. That is pretty annoying, but I wanted to mention it because there is a workaround that I wanted to tell you about. Get the app USB Audio Player Pro from the Play Store, and that will allow you to adjust the hardware volume for the Apple dongle. Not only will this allow you to play music from Tidal, Cobas, or local files in USB Audio Player Pro with full volume on Android, but also that change persists even after you close the app. So you can just use USB Audio Player Pro to unlock the full volume of this device and then close it and watch YouTube or stream from the native Tidal app or whatever it is you want to do. But yeah, pretty neat little device. If you are happy to spend a little bit more money, and by that I mean $20 more, so not all that much more, to get rid of those volume limitations and to get something which I think sounds better and objectively performs better, then have a look at the Fio KA11. Like the Apple dongle, this is a USB-C dongle DAC and there is a lightning version available as well. Same 3.5mm output, but this will do 25 volts output, 200 milliwatts into 32 ohms, so even quite a few planars you can run directly on this with no issue whatsoever, and it gets about 111 dB compared to the about 99-100 dB total harmonic distortion and noise performance that the Apple dongle does, so it's a little bit better in that regard as well. Also, I've noticed that the Apple dongle is more susceptible to a noisy source, so if you're connecting it directly to a beefy desktop or something than this is. This performs a little bit better and doesn't let as much noise through. It's just overall a better device for $20 more, and still in terms of value compared to basically any kind of dedicated desktop device, this is really, really good. And this is what I'd recommend to a lot of people that just want something that is solid as an upgrade for onboard audio, running IEMs, or full-size headphones with this one because it is quite a bit more powerful. Yeah. All round, just a really nice device, great performance for the money. Not much more to say than that. And actually, whilst we're mentioning power, I'm gonna get something real quick. This is the Benchmark AHP2. Now you're probably thinking, that's a speaker amp, not a headphone amp. And you'd be right, but I would also beg to differ slightly because whilst this is a speaker amplifier, 100 watts at eight ohms as well, so quite a beefy one, it's so good from an objective standpoint that it works excellently as a headphone amp. In fact, this was my main headphone amplifier for quite a long time because it sounds great, it's objectively great, and in fact, the noise floor alone on this is so low, you can comfortably run IEMs on it. Actually, at CanJam London, I believe it was, they were running the Subtonic Storm IEMs on this as their demo setup, and it sounded excellent. If I just do my normal 4 volts output into a 32 ohm load test that I do when measuring any normal headphone amplifier, this gets about 113 dB Synad, so it's already beating a lot of dedicated headphone amps, and it's only losing 7 or so dB from the best performing headphone amps you can get. 
and the distortion versus frequency is basically perfect. Distortion versus levels basically perfect. Distortion, uh, intermodulation distortion, crosstalk, all of it's excellent, and it sounds fantastic too. I like the sound of this a lot more than, honestly, most headphone amps I've tried, and then it'll do 25 watts at 32 ohms as well, hence why I used it as my main headphone amp for so long. Now, there are some drawbacks, obviously. It's a bit bigger than most headphone amps, but for a speaker amp, especially this powerful, it's pretty compact. You do need a preamplifier because this is a power amp, so there's no way to do volume control. But if you have a DAC with digital volume control, that could work too. And then you just need to get an adapter. This one was made for me by Double Helix Cables to adapt the speak on output on the back to XLR to connect headphones. But honestly, whilst it is a little bit ridiculous, this is technically a desk-friendly, ultra-powerful headphone amplifier that is objectively great, sounds great, and will mean that you can run absolutely anything. Okay, to calm down the silliness a bit and talk about something that's a little bit more of a value-oriented proposition, this is a product which I'd actually reviewed in full recently, and you can watch that video here. There's also a link in the description. Don't watch it now, watch it later. This is the GDS Element 4, and I love this product for a number of reasons. One just being the build. There are of course a lot of other products which are compact and will fit nicely on a desk, but nothing I think which is quite as sleek and aesthetically appealing overall as this. It's ultra low profile and flat while still having a nice big and nice feeling volume control as well, meaning you don't even have to glance and look for a tiny little volume control. It's packed full of features, it's powerful, you can run just about any kind of headphones you might want to on this, and it sounds great and objectively performs great. In fact, the conclusion from my review was basically, if you don't want to spend more than a thousand dollars or so, this is the best sounding DAC amp combo that I've tried without even considering all the features. And the features are one of the best bits. This has built-in EQ controllable via a web interface, so you can adjust your headphones to sound however you like, and all of that processing is done on the device itself. The UI is also really nice to control. Uh, there are a couple quirks with it, go and watch the full review, but for the most part, it does an excellent job. And I also like that doing that rather than using EQ API or something means you don't have to go through Windows Mixer, there's no resampling or anything like that, and Windows Mixer can cause some quality issues in certain instances, so being able to do EQ, even if you are feeding this bit perfect from Tidal or Kobos or something, is awesome. It looks great, it sounds great, it's powerful, it's objectively great, there's just not really any kind of drawback, and for $500, this is just one of my favorite products. One of my absolute favorite DAX or amps of all time has got to be the Dale HM1. And this is definitely going back into the more expensive category again. It's about $9,000 at the moment, and they also only make 50 of these a year. So if you don't get your order in early, it's quite tricky to get your hands on one. But there are so many things about it beyond just the sound itself, for which I absolutely adore it. The HM1 is handmade by Michael Zale, who is known for his ultra-high-end mixing desks. He's made them for the likes of Aphex Twin, the Chemical Brothers, Nils Fram, and they usually start at around $100,000 depending on how you've got them configured. But a lot of his experience and knowledge in terms of making mixing desks has been transferred over to the HM1, as well as some of the features itself. The HM1 is called that because it's the headphone mixing amplifier. And as a reviewer, the fact that it's got two inputs that I can either select between or mix together and independently control the volume for is great not just for comparing DACs for example when I'm reviewing things but also I've got one DAC from my PC that plays all of my computer sounds and voice chat and whatever I'm doing and another dedicated DAC which is just streaming from Rune and is playing my music and I can independently mix those two together without having to do any software nonsense. You can also apply EQ effects directly on the amplifier, choosing one, the other, or both inputs at the same time, and those EQ effects seem to be drastically more transparent than basically any other analog EQ tool that I've come across, because where a lot of analog EQ options can mean a sacrifice in distortion performance, they can increase THD by 20, 30, or more dB in some cases, the change here is about 4 dB. That is it. They're pretty much completely transparent and kind of shows the experience coming from the analog EQ effects and all of his mixing desks that he's brought over. Also, crossfeed. Crossfeed is something which you'll see in a lot of amps, and this doesn't have crossfeed, it's got something which I think is better. It has what they're calling the stereo bass adjustment, and this, in the analog domain again, makes an adjustment to the overall size of soundstage without, like crossfeed does, just sort of pushing things in front and smearing it all. I really like this effect a lot more than standard crossfeed, and for headphones in particular, it just works exceptionally well. The other thing though, is just the fact that the amplifier itself from a technical perspective is exceptionally impressive. This is a fully discrete Class A amplifier that rather uniquely allows you to choose whether you'd like to run it with feedback correction, as almost all headphone amps would have, or to turn feedback off entirely. 
most headphone amps will just have feedback. That's part of how they're achieving their performance and you can't turn it off or anything or remove it. Um, there are a few headphone amps out there which do advertise as a feature that they don't have any feedback, but almost invariably they won't perform objectively anyway all that well. And whilst some of them subjectively I have quite liked, they've all been coloured to some degree just because the objective performance has not been all that great. It's hard to get really good objective performance without having feedback. But the HM1 does so, and then it gets even better if you turn the feedback on. And again, this is a fully discrete Class A amplifier, there's no op amps or anything being used here. It is incredibly impressive just from a performance standpoint. It is, to my ear, the best sounding headphone amp I've heard, period. And then you add all of the extra features on top, the mixing, the EQ, and the inputs and outputs with the preamp and A through circuit that allow you to do some really unique stuff in terms of having a second amp. and having the ability to use this as a preamp to run that one directly, or to have that one tube preamp back into the HM1 without needing to fumble with cables. You can just change it with the press of a button. It's just fantastic, both as a reviewer, but also just in terms of sound. I absolutely adore it and had to mention it in this video. I also wanted to include something that I really enjoy, not necessarily because of sound quality, but rather for the features and just general enjoyment of using it that it represents. And that's gotta be the Eversolo DMP A6. The DMP A6 is a network streamer that you can also just use with USB from your desktop PC. And it's got digital output if you wanted to feed a higher end DAC of your own, for instance, or a really solid built in DAC if you wanted to use it internally. And you can use it as a music server, either from streaming from services with the built in apps like Tidal, Cobas, Spotify, loading local files. It's got a Rune endpoint built in, so you can stream directly from Rune. And with any of these, you'll get a nice big display for the album art, all of your playback controls, which will feed back to the network service you're using as well if you are using Rune, for instance. And you can do a bunch of extra stuff, like again, applying EQ, which just about every product should have. Most desktop DACs at almost any price point, you might get a display to see changing settings or maybe an FFT if you're lucky, but having something that is this big with all of the playback controls that looks this nice and can display VU meters, the album art, that just gives me a really nice bonus in terms of how much I'm enjoying listening to music. In fact, whilst I don't use the DMP A6 as a DAC or as a streamer all that much, I'll often have it just in my desk or in my speaker setup because that album art display is just so nice to have. The closest thing that I can think of that actually gets you all the same features as the DMP A6 would be the Hi-Fi Rose streamers, which are thousands and thousands of dollars. So it is a pretty unique option in terms of what it represents for the money and the things that it lets you do and as a streamer or as a DAC and streamer combo, it's exceptional value and something which, just because of that display alone, I find just makes me smile more when I'm listening to music. My absolute favorite DAC that I've ever heard, and one that from a technological standpoint as well is just incredibly impressive, has got to be the Hollow Audio May. Now, this is an R2R DAC, and R2R DACs have a reputation for not measuring all that well because they usually don't. R2R DACs are really hard to make accurate in practice because just the resistor tolerances alone have to be so tight that any slight variance and you will struggle to get above about 100 dB in terms of total harmonic distortion and noise performance, which is why even R2R DACs costing tens of thousands of dollars usually get 96 to 100 dB THD plus N at best, but the May gets 118 dB. It is the most accurate R2R DAC you can get period, besides maybe that new analog devices chip, which I need to do some testing on. And it's by quite a margin as well. In fact, the only other ones that get close to it are Hollow Audio's own lower end models. And this is on an R2R DAC doing no digital processing whatsoever. The latency of it's 0.2 milliseconds because you don't need to do any oversampling. It'll run full non-oversampling and convert the PCM samples that you feed it completely natively. So that low latency clearly means that it's also the best gaming DAC you can get as well, I guess. I'm not generally on board with the idea that a more purist approach is always better. In fact, in many cases, more complex approaches and designs are demonstrably the better way to go. But I gotta say there is something kind of nice about getting this level of performance from just straight R2R, converting those PCM audio samples natively with no processing whatsoever. There's just something kind of nice about that. The main downside to the May for me is that the internal oversampling is not great, and it's primarily intended to be used either non-oversampling or with high-performance external oversampling. That's why it's got such high sample rate input, up to PCM 1.536 MHz or DSD1024, if you want to use the separate 1-bit DSD converter. NOS, whilst it is interesting and I do like it for certain genres, it does roll off treble a bit, so it's not great for either reviewing stuff, and it's not, strictly speaking, the most transparent way to go either. 
And I'll finish up this video with the product that I probably use more than anything else I own, and that is the Cord Mojo 2. This is a portable DAC and headphone amp combo that you can just use as a standalone DAC, including at your desktop. It's got a desktop mode where if you just leave it plugged into power on one USB port and data on the other, that light will turn purple once the battery is fully charged, and then it'll protect the battery. You can just leave it running as a desktop DAC as long as you like but you can also run headphones directly on it. It'll run things up to moderately hard to drive planars. You're not gonna be running a Sasvara or something on this, but for IEMs, this is straight up my favorite source. And for most dynamic driver headphones, it's one of the best portable devices, in my opinion, that you can get. Cord Electronics has got some interesting design aspects. Um, you may have heard the term FPGA DAC before. FPGA DACs don't technically exist. An FPGA is not the actual DAC itself. An FPGA is just either doing digital processing or controlling the DAC circuitry. In the case of a hollow DAC, the FPGA is controlling the R2R ladder. In the case of a DCS DAC, the FPGA is controlling the ring DAC. And in the case of a cord DAC, the FPGA is controlling the pulse array, which is cord's proprietary DAC design. But cord also uses particularly powerful FPGAs, even in their portable products like the Mojo 2, to do higher performance digital signal processing, the oversampling and the delta sigma modulator than any other Delta Sigma DAC that I'm aware of. The modulator in their Dave is accurate to minus 300 dB, just in case you wanted that. And the oversampling performance, including in the Mojo 2, is better than any other DAC that I'm aware of. This, just in terms of Synad performance, is not going to beat a lot of other products, be it portable or desktop. There are other products which outperform it in that regard, but various other aspects like the reconstruction performance, which I've actually done a video in a blind test to show that it does make quite an audible difference, that is better on this than any other product. And the overall sound from this device is something that I just absolutely love. It's my go-to source for IEMs. It's what I use at home. And if I'm out and about, I'll just connect this via USB to my phone. If I'm in the house, then I'll actually use Cord's Poly, which allows me to stream directly from Rune, bit perfect, to the Mojo 2. But this I love because as well as the excellent sound quality that you get out of it and pretty excellent objective performance, including in areas that don't usually get too much attention paid to them, it's also got some extra features like, again, built-in EQ. The EQ in this is not as configurable as other options. The bands are fixed, you can just adjust the level of them, but when I'm using IEMs or a particular headphone and I just want to up the bass shelf, take the mids down a bit or boost the treble up, something like that, then that gives me everything I need. So still having those EQ options, even if they're not completely configurable, is a massive step up between just take it or leave it stock frequency response. The build quality on this is absolutely solid. It is a little heavy, but it's about credit card size, just thicker, obviously, so it fits into your pocket really, really nicely. And overall, this is my favorite portable source. If you want to see the full review, you can go and watch that here. There's a link in the description to it as well. But you don't need to take my word for it. There's a lot of feedback on this because at about 500 or so pounds, I'm not actually sure what the US price is. It'll be on screen here. It's not inaccessible. It's definitely expensive for a portable device. And you can get other things like a Questile CMA18P, which will give you more power if you want to run a Heifermann Sesvara on the bus, for instance. But in terms of raw sound quality, this is my absolute favorite. Those are just some of the audio products which I enjoy listening to the most or find interesting and appreciate the design and tech that's gone into them for one reason or another. And I hope you enjoyed listening to me ramble about them for 20 minutes or so. If you've got any questions that you wanted to ask about anything that was discussed in this video or any kind of music, gear, headphones, DAX, amps, or anything else at all, come and say hey on the new headphones.com forum, which has recently had a revamp, and we'd love to hear you and your questions there. Or if you prefer, come and say hey on the headphones.com Discord server. I hope you enjoyed a little bit more of a light-hearted bit of content this weekend, but until next time, I'll see you guys soon.